What if you discovered that you were royalty? What if you took a DNA test and that you discovered that uh, you were a prince or princess? Wouldn't that be pretty cool? Uh, well, this actually happened to a man, uh, uh, a man named Jay Spates. Uh, he is a descendant of African-American slaves, uh, and his family was brought to America on slave ships, and so he didn't know his ancestry because his heritage got lost uh, in that, that voyage, that, that change. Uh, but using modern technology, he took a DNA test that showed he had royal DNA. And he came back on the test, and he took it a couple different ones. Uh, and he found out that he was from the West African country of Benin. Benin. Uh, now, Jay uh, met a man who gave him the phone number of the king of Benin. Uh, and he actually called the king uh, of that country. The king hung up on him because I guess you don't cold call kings. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the article shared this, that I read this. Uh, but he did talk with the king's wife, uh, who confirmed that he was indeed a prince, uh, a descendant of King Decca from uh, 1746 to 1765 is when this king ruled. Uh, and she invited him to come and visit. And so he flew from Virginia to uh, Benin, and when he got off the, the airplane, he was walking through the airport. Am I just slaughtering the name of the country? I kind of wonder if I am, because people are smiling at me. Uh, he got off the plane, and his family photos are just like plastered over the airport. Like his photos of his family are everywhere in the airport. He had sent some photos to uh, the queen, and they had printed them out and put them all over uh, the airport. And when he walked outside the airport, there was a festival going on. Uh, and hundreds of people were dancing and playing instruments and singing, and he realized that this was a welcome party for him, uh, coming home as the long-lost prince. It's a pretty amazing story. What if this were your story? What if something like this happened to you, that you discovered you were royalty, and you flew across the world to find, uh, to return to your homeland? Now, uh, most of us don't have that story, uh, we don't share the, the same story as Jay. Uh, but I do believe that we are, uh, as believers, spiritual descendants of not slaves, but a king. That we are indeed royalty. And I want us to discover our identity this morning. I want each one of us to discover our true identity. I want us to kind of take a spiritual DNA test uh, and, and find out that we are a child of God, a child of the king, not just a king of a country, but the king of the entire universe. If this is true, would that be amazing? <laughs> I think it would be amazing. Like we sing about being a child of God. Well, do we really believe it? Do we know that it's true for sure? Well, to find out, we need to look at some of our own history. Just like Jay took a, uh, a DNA test and looked into his ancestry, we're going to look into kind of the ancestry we discover in the Bible. And so we're going to discover our heritage. We need to discover your heritage. We're going to go back to our roots, and we're going to start at the very beginning of the story. So if you're not, uh, oh, man, <laughs> I just found some spelling errors. I'm like on a roll. This is like the third or fourth week in a row. I need Andy to proof my, my slides. Uh, this isn't introducing a lot of trust between me as the speaker and you as the listener. Uh, just give me some grace here, and I will correct those before I post them. Uh, <laughs> so if you're not super familiar with the story of the Bible, uh, we can start at the beginning, uh, because that's really where the story starts in the book of uh, Genesis and the Garden of Eden, the story of creation. Uh, Adam and Eve, we might not tend to think of them this way, but they were really the first king and the first queen uh, because God gave them all of creation to rule over, uh, to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion. That word dominion is a, is a kind of rulership word. It's a, a, a word having to do with having authority over others. And what happened? Well, God's enemy came into that garden, the serpent, the snake, uh, uh, kind of uh, Satan embodied, and he messed it all up because he tempted the first king and queen to stop trusting their ultimate ruler and trust in their rule instead, to trust themselves. What happened? Well, Adam and Eve and all of their kingdom, all of this world was thrown into sin and into darkness and into brokenness and corruption. Uh, it became a kind of fallen state, uh, a state without a ruler. 
well, without the rulers God intended. And it actually came under the rule of the serpent, of Satan himself. But God promised to send a new king, a new ruler, to defeat the serpent. And the story kind of goes on. Maybe you're familiar with that flood uh, with Noah. Well, after the flood, God uh, promises, uh, God, God makes a promise to a man named Abraham, whose wife uh, is Sarah. Her name means princess. And so Abraham, although he's called the father of the Israelite people, he really is a type of king. He is a type of ruler. And God makes this promise to a man named Abraham. He says, I will bless you. I will bless you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This is amazing. This is the very first book of the Bible, and God is promising that through Abraham, through his descendants, through his children, God is going to bless the whole world. See, God's, uh, Abraham's children are, are going to become God's children. Abraham's children are going to become God's children. Now, Abraham has a child, uh, uh, miraculously he has a child named Isaac, who has then a son named Jacob. So it's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons uh, uh, that become the 12 uh, tribes of Israel. But then those tribes, they go down into Egypt, uh, where they come under the evil rule of a fallen king named Pharaoh. Now God sends a leader named Moses to lead the people out of bondage, out of captivity. And this is what God says when he sends Moses down there. He says, then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord uh, uh, says. Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. So here, what is God doing? God is is saying that the, those descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel, the people of Israel, there's something special about them. They're God's children. They're God's people. And so this identity as the children of God really begins to define the Israelite people. And that, that's a great thing. That could be an encouraging thing. But, but then they begin to act like God's not really their father, <laughs> that, that, that they're really not a child of God. They begin to put their trust in other things, other nations, uh, and in idols. They worship false gods. God eventually takes them to the promised land, uh, but then they don't get to stay in the promised land. Why? Because they sin, and they turn from God, and they rebel. And so they end up going into exile in Babylon. Now, uh, to go into exile is a, a really significant thing. It, it, it shapes your identity. I don't think we really understand what it what it means. Uh, and Jay, in his story, he got a sense of this when he visited his home. Uh, see, in Benin, there is a tree that once stood near the city's historic slave port. Millions of people were shipped from the slave port, uh, shipped to the Americas. But before they departed, uh, there was a tree that people would walk around nine times, uh, and they called it the tree of forgetting. And as they walked around, they would try to leave behind their past and accept the bondage into which they had been sold. And then they were sold into bondage and they lost that heritage. They lost their ancestry. Going into exile, going into slavery uh, is massively devastating. It's devastating on your humanity, on your identity, on who you are as a person. And as uh, as of Egypt, uh, as of, as of uh, the Garden of Eden, when we sinned and we disobeyed God, we went into spiritual exile. <laughs> Each one of us has entered into an exile where, where sometimes we feel abandoned by God, where we sense all is not right with our Heavenly Father, where we are far from Him. And yet God has a plan. God has a plan that through His uh, through his, his children, through Abraham's children, he's going to, to, to welcome more children into the family of God. And so uh, it's possible to then return, to return to, to the family of God, to come home. And so uh, kind of the story continues a little bit. Jay, actually, when he went to this, this tree, Jay Spates, uh, when he went to this tree and saw this tree of forgetting, uh, he was able to kind of turn it into a tree of remembrance. Now, the, today the tree is gone, uh, but there's still a marker. And uh, as his newfound relatives watched, Jay uh, walked the other direction. He kind of reversed the path. 
uh, and, he, and he walked around that marker nine times in reverse. And with each turn, he thought about his family and uh, his, his slavery that they had experienced. Uh, he thought about his grandfather and uh, his ancestors. And he felt all that hurt. He felt all that pain. Uh, but he was able to also find some healing as he, as he kind of uh, reversed the, the tree of forgetting into a tree of remembrance. This man had to come home from exile, and we need to come home from exile. Israel needs to come home from exile in Babylon, but we need to come home from spiritual exile. I don't know where you are in your story, but maybe you're in exile. Maybe you're far from God. Well, today is an opportunity. Today is an opportunity to come uh, back to God's family, to, to join the one and true uh, eternal family. Now, uh, we can't just walk around a tree and return to Eden. That's not how it works. Uh, we can't kind of go through the process of a tree of uh, remembrance. Like, we can't reverse that with anything we can do. But that's why we need the gospel. That's why we need Jesus, right? Because Jesus actually hung on a tree uh, to bring us redemption, on the tree of redemption, the cross. God knew that the people of Israel, the children of Israel, were never really going to be the children he needed them to be. So what did God do? He sent his son. He sent his one and only, like, truly uh, true son. Uh, God the Father sent him to, to do ministry on this earth and to bring the children of God back into his family. Matthew 3.17 says this, uh, And a voice came from heaven and said this, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus is the true and complete son of God. He's the biological child of God, and Jesus doesn't sin, Jesus doesn't rebel, Jesus lives a really good life, a perfect life, and he's that ultimate descendant that we need. He's that ultimate child of God that can bring other children into the family. He's that one that God is going to use to bless all the nations. Remember that promise to Abraham? And that means that you and I can come into the family of God. And in order to win our salvation, you know what this son did? He lost, in one sense, his, his father. See, at the cross, Jesus was uh, forsaken. He was abandoned. At the cross, Jesus, Jesus had known and experienced the Father's love for all eternity. At the cross, he, he, he experienced God's crushing anger, his crushing wrath. Notice what Jesus says uh, when he's hanging on the cross. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried it out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Does that sound like a child that is experiencing and knowing his father's love? No. This is what Jesus did. The true child <laughs> became an orphan. The true child of God became an orphan orphan so that you and I can experience our Heavenly Father's love so that we can come into the family. That's what the gospel message is. Jesus became abandoned and forsaken so that we don't have to be, so that we don't have to know desolation in our relationship with the Father, but we can know true love. This is what the tree of redemption does. <laughs> and so the question is, have you joined the family? Have you, have you received this? Have you accepted this gift? Or is this just, this just a story, just a myth? Something that doesn't really count. You and I, we can come into God's family. Come and join the family. Join the family. I spelled family correctly. Praise God. <laughs> this is the most important invitation you and I will ever receive See, Jesus invites us to join the family. Anyone can become a child of God through faith in Christ. Anyone. Anyone can become a child of God. Now, nation, the nation of Israel, they were called like the children of God, the sons of God. But actually, in reality, it was never about biology. It was never about blood. It was never about like uh, tangible DNA. It was always, always, always about faith. It was always about belief in God. Galatians 3, the apostle Paul wrote, and he points back to Abraham's faith, and he explains what Abraham's faith in God was really all about. 
And that it was faith that, that granted salvation. It wasn't biology. Galatians 3, 6 through 8 says, So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So who's a true child of Abraham? Anyone who has faith in God, anyone who has faith in Christ Jesus. So it's not about biology. Imagine for a moment if you had to take a blood test to get into heaven. (laughs) Maybe you've uh, donated blood and you know your blood type. Uh, And in order to get into heaven, you have to be O positive. Is there anyone who would get into heaven here? I would get into heaven. (laughs) Very convenient for my illustration. All right, so about five of us (laughs) would get into heaven. The O positives. That would be really bad news, wouldn't it? That would be really bad news. That's not the gospel. That's not the story of the Bible. God used an O-positive person. <laughs> I don't know if Jesus had O-positive blood. Jesus, God used someone with real flesh and real blood, his own son. He took on human form, and he had blood running through his veins, and he spilt that blood on a cross so that people with other types of blood can come into the family of God. That's really good news. That's what what the word Gentile means, someone who's not Jewish. Anyone, whether you're Jew or Gentile, if you believe in Christ, you can be welcomed into the family. This is what our our verse today for this passage is all about, John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. This doesn't mean you just like theoretically believe in Jesus, like, oh yeah, I believe Christmas is really about the birth of Christ, and Easter is also about Christ. This, this means that Jesus defines who you are as a person, that all of your life is about Jesus. Obviously, this does not mean that we all have to be pastors or missionaries uh, uh, or, or uh, you know, go into another country. But this does mean that every part of your life, every moment, is ultimately becoming about Christ. It's coming under his lordship, that I'm living my life for him instead of for myself. Maybe you've heard it said that, like, we're all children of God. You've probably heard that said in the, uh, on a movie or, or somewhere, or maybe a friend said it. Oh, yeah, we're all God's children. That's actually not true. We're not. The Bible says that it's only those that know Christ Jesus that are the children of God. Now, does this mean that you don't have value if you don't believe in Jesus? No. The Bible says that everyone is made in God's image. That means whether you believe in Jesus or not, you have immense value and worth and are incredibly precious to God. But you're not God's child unless you know Jesus. And so we want, we want this family to grow, <laughs> We want you, if you're not a child of God, to become a child of God, to come and join the family. And how? Receive Christ. Believe in his name. And you become a child of God. You have that right. This is something to really think about if you're not a child of God yet. And honestly, we can't really do it in our own power. Because maybe you've thought about this for a while and you're like, you know what, I just don't feel it. I just don't feel it. I've thought about becoming a Christian or believing, but I just, I've never felt it, uh, and I I can't get past that. That's understandable, and that's why we need God's help. We need the Holy Spirit to soften our hearts to Jesus. There's a story in the Bible of a Pharisee named Nicodemus, and if you're not familiar with the word Pharisee, Pharisees uh, were supposed to have it all together. They were supposed to know everything. They had the right blood type, (laughs) all O-positive. They had the right DNA, they obeyed God, they, they read the scriptures, they did all the religious activity, and yet when, when Nicodemus, this Pharisee, comes to Jesus, Jesus says, that's not what it's about. It's not about having all your religious like, uh, uh, boxes checked. It's not about being a good person. It's not about having the right family or giving enough money to charity. It's about me. You gotta be born again by the Holy Spirit how can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. 
Surely they cannot enter a second time into the mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of the water and spirit. See, God has to do a work in your heart. And so my, my encouragement to you is if you're wrestling with faith, to pray. To pray, hey God, would you help me out? <laughs> would you give me the faith I need? Because when I look down deep into my heart, if I'm honest with myself, I don't have it. It's better to pray that prayer than to fake it. So just pray, God, would you grant me faith in you if you're real? And then connect that with like the Bible. <laughs> connect that with coming to a church so that you have a place that can help teach you what it's all about. God wants to connect your Holy Spirit with his word and to do an amazing work in your life. I want to be a part of that. I want to see that happen. You know your heritage and you've joined the family. And now you need to learn to live as a child of God. You need to learn how to live as a child of the king. When, when Jay went to uh, that West African country, he had to learn what it meant to be a prince. Like they took him on a tour. Uh, he went, he called it prince school. <laughs> where he was learning the local customs and visiting various sites and dignitaries. Uh, the king enthroned him. Uh, he gave, the king gave him uh, uh, some robes and some crowns. He had an armed guard that kept watch outside of his hotel door. A local journalist followed him around. This is just a normal guy from Virginia. <laughs> this is a picture of Jay. He's like princely garb and his scepter and his crown. When you find out that you're a child of the king, it should change you. It changed this man's life. So that's our challenge here, is to live as a child of God, to live as his child. This means we relate to God as our father. This means you can relate to the Lord of the universe as your father. And this is encouraging because some of us, we didn't have very good fathers. Our, our fathers disappointed us. What if you could have the perfect father? What if you could have a father who never disappointed, who never walked out? That would be really encouraging. In fact, Romans says that you can call God Abba Father. Abba Father. That's a, that is a term like daddy or papa, but it's not necessarily a term like, kind of we think of like a baby cooing that. It's not necessarily that. It's, it's a cry out. It's like when uh, my son is crying in the next room because he wants me and we're trying to put him to bed and he's just like screaming, Dada, Dada. This is like the cry that Jesus cried as he hung on the cross. And so that's incredibly encouraging that you can come before God and you can lift up your arms uh, like, a, like an infant, like uh, seeking its daddy, his daddy or his, his parents. And you can come before God and lift up your arms and ask for help. Cry out for your father. What do you need to talk to God about? What do you need to tell your father about? He's ready to hear you. Live as his child. We're, we get to relate to God as our father. We get to live holy lives. Part of being a Christian is acting like our father, right? My son likes to say the things I say and do the things I do and eat the food I eat even when I'm eating it. <laughs> and that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to become like our heavenly father. The Bible says that... Like, there's supposed to be like this fundamental change in who you are. This doesn't mean that you suddenly you become like, like, like perfectly the Jesus copy and that you're, you're perfect and you're never sinning, you're never doing anything wrong. But it does mean that like your life begins to change course. No longer are you headed towards, uh, towards your own destiny and your own place, but you're kind of headed, you're, you're beginning to head down God's path. And you're just figuring out what it means to follow Jesus every day uh, as you walk through it. And third, we get to invite others to join the family. The Bible says that we are adopted. Today is Orphan Sunday. If you're adopted, that means you are loved uh, even though uh, you are different than God. You're loved by God, by your Heavenly Father, even though you're different than Him. 
And that's what we're called to do, to go out and to love those who are different than us, to welcome them into God's family. If you've been adopted, I've been adopted. Like we watched in that video, one of the actual ways to do this, to get to invite others to join God's family, is adoption. As believers, uh, I read a, a book this week, uh, I, was, I was listening to parts of it, Russell Moore's Adopted for Life. If you want to learn more about adoption, please check out that book, Adopted for Life. It's a really good read. But he, he just pounds this idea that uh, adoption should be normal to Christians. Adoption should be something that is just natural to who we are because, because it's rooted in the gospel. That God welcomes us into his family, and so we should go out and welcome others into, into our families. And that's part of what it means to invite others to join God's family. Now, maybe you can't adopt, or that's not your calling, but there are ways to support financially. There are ways to pray for and encourage other families that do want to do it. There are some programs like Safe Families where you can sign up to help watch a kid for a couple days whose parents in the hospital. That's kind of similar to adoption, short term. Uh, my, I was just at the Akinge program this week, and uh, one of the pastors told us a story when, he was, when we were in China. Uh, so he was a missionary to China, and he, he knew a guy... Um, I don't know if it's this other man's story or someone else's, but there was a man from the UK who's a Christian, and he helped with foster and long-term adoption, uh, or long-term fostering and adoption, and he helped with that in the UK. And he was coming to China uh, and then Mongolia uh, to learn more about how they did it in Mongolia. And he met the government official in China, and they rode the train up to Mongolia. And as they were going, this man shared a little bit about his faith. He was a little guarded, uh, but he shared a little bit about his faith, and uh, the Mongolian guy was just uh, listening and, and, and hearing to, uh, to this man's story, and they got up uh, to a banquet. Uh, There's about 12 families there at this banquet, uh, and uh, the, the, the state leader, he said, you know, we want to welcome uh, uh, this man from the UK. Uh, it's great to have him here. Uh, he's a Christian, but, uh, you know, there's no Christians here. And he kind of said it as a joke, and everyone in the room was just quiet. <laughs> They're just silent. They didn't laugh. And then one woman raised her hand and actually said, well, we're Christians. And then, like, most of the families in that room identified saying, yeah, we're Christians too. It was the Christians that were adopting. It was the, the believers that were welcoming others into their families. Why? Because it's rooted in the gospel itself, that you and I are adopted. And on the way back, that man from the U.K. got to share more uh, with this government official and so the, the final call here is to just live as a child of God. Live as a child of God. Uh, that's a journey. But it's a journey uh, to our homeland. It's a journey home, just like this, this man from, uh, from Virginia returned to his home country. Apparently the king gave him a new name, Videkon Deka, which means the child who came back. The child who came back. If you don't know Christ Jesus, that can be your name. You can be the child that came back. And maybe you're already the child that came back, but you've forgotten who your father is. Today, I want to be a reminder of, of who, who your father is. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for your word. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you that our, our true Father uh, is our Heavenly Father. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.